when Detective realizes Team Family for Fame. Broken Air 911. Hello? I hope my brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I think I had to step on. You stabbed him off? Yeah, I got it. When she was walking away, I think I had to go for a night, but, you know, I, Is that when you cut yourself, then? Yeah, I think I'd have to do that. Where did you shoot her? I just had to go from behind and kind of go by. Did you cut her? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think. Yeah. I would call him by then James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot at the theater. In Colorado? Yeah. He was 12 and, uh, wow. How many were Columbine. Columbine, I don't know, like 15, okay. I think. Did you guys have a goal? Did you have a number? He just wanted, I think he wanted like 50. Okay. I mean, I have a goal. He just wanted to be famous. Mm -hmm. What did you want? Me? Mm -hmm. You keep talking about what he wanted, what did you want? Mm -hmm. Wow. Team coverage this season. One of the <laughs> Not baby drive. Of murdering his five family members in Broken Arrow. Five members of a Broken Arrow family murdered. One member of the family, a 12 year old girl, survived and identified her brothers as. Wow. This is a YouTube video of the Beaver Brothers films in 2013 a stark contrast from the previous clip. This is a fun-filled video of two teenage brothers trying out their way to be creative and famous. The eldest of the seven siblings, Robert and Michael, were pretty close. The family lived at 709 Magnolia Court, Oklahoma. However, in the present day, their house doesn't exist anymore. There's a reflection park in the same location. Damn. The tragedy behind turning this home into a reflective park is heart-wrenching. A home where sweet laughters and giggles that echoed were silenced forever. A crime was committed that questioned the boundaries of human behavior. Before we proceed, a little heads up. This video contains intense topics and unsettling psychological elements of the human mind. Viewer discretion is advised. Your well being and mental health are the top priority. At 11.30 p.m. of July 22, 2015, Broken Arrow police received a call from Donations. a 12 year old named Daniel Beaver reporting Donations. a family attack at a house on East Magnolia Court. Bruce, please check out this suck of a video. Broken Air 911. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna this. Hello? Oh. Hi, where are you at? Broken Air, Oklahoma 7411. What address? 709 Magnolia Court. Seven, okay, are you the only one there? No, my brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. <laughs> Okay, who's attacking your family? Bitch! What? Who's attacking your family? Yes. Who, who is it? Do they have I'll call them. No, I'm Are you there? Hello? Wow. These were Daniel's last words, as just after the call, he was stabbed 21 times by his elder brother, Michael. Upon arrival, they discovered 13-year-old Crystal with multiple stab wounds, who identified her brothers, Robert wow. and Michael, as the killers. Tragically, five members of the Beaver family, including the father, mother, and three siblings, were found deceased. The youngest sibling, two years old, Autumn, was found unharmed sleeping in her crib. Michael Beaver, aged 16, and Robert Beaver, aged 18, were discovered hiding in a wooded area behind their family's residence, allegedly covered in dirt and blood. Both were subsequently arrested post-midnight by K-9. Both were taken under custody facing charges of five counts of first-degree murder smiled. and one count of assault and battery with a deadly weapon. The following interrogation Ooh, is of Michael angry. Beaver, who explained all the unanswered questions. Questions about the intricacies of the crime, its gruesome nature, and most importantly, the reason behind killing their own family. Can you still read some stuff to you? It makes it legal for us to talk to you, okay? 
Um, so like I told you when I met you at the jail, my name's Eric. I'm a detective here with Broken Air Police. Like she told you, her name's Rihanna. She's a detective also. Um, and uh, we just want to spend some time, maybe talk and discuss some things and maybe ask you some questions, let you ask us some questions and make sure we're all comfortable with what's going on and then we'll go from there. That's how we Okay. In Michael's interrogation, his demeanor appears notably anxious and fatigued, with visible signs of nervousness in both his facial expressions and body language. This suggests that he may be experiencing significant stress or discomfort during the questioning. Considering Michael's age and also the gravity of the crime, Detective Eric Bentz adopts a reassuring and persuasive tone to make himself more approachable towards Michael. However, the subtle assertiveness in his body language also sets the intention of the interrogation clear to Michael. Okay, so you've probably heard or seen this on TV before, but it's your notification of rights, your Miranda rights. And so I'm going to read them to you, but I want to sit here where you can see the paper, because I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read one through five right here. And so I'll read them, and you kind of can look at it with me. I want to make sure you understand all these. Um, you have the right to remain silent. You do not have to answer any questions or make any statement. Anything you say can be really used against you in court. Oh, what the you fuck? You have the right to talk to a lawyer before Why is not cut the murderer? You have the right to have a lawyer with you during Yo. questioning. If you cannot afford a lawyer and want one, the court will appoint one for you before you are asked any questions. Um, it's hard to read it sideways. Um, if you want to answer questions now without a lawyer being present, you may do so. You have the right to stop answering questions at any time. Do so you understand what those are saying? Basically, if you want an attorney, just tell me. Um, if you don't like any of the questions I ask, just tell me to stop. Um, if you get uncomfortable, we'll stop whenever you want. Kind of, you're in control. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to read this waiver to you right here, yeah. and you look at it as I read it to you because I want to make sure you understand it. Um, <clears throat> it says, I have read the statement of my rights shown above. I understand what my rights are. I'm willing to answer questions and make a statement. I do not want a lawyer present at this time. I understand and know what I am doing. No promises or threats have been made to me, and no pressure of any kind has been used against me. So if you agree with that statement that I just read to you, that you're looking at, if you'll sign right there for me. I don't know how well I can do my signature. Yeah, just whatever you can do the best. Okay, that's all we need. So, you put high school for your formal education, yeah. and are you presently on any drugs or medication? You answered no. Are you under the influence of alcohol? You answered no. And you do read and speak English, obviously. You put yes. Yeah. Sound good? Okay. Um, do you take any prescription medications? As Detective Bentz reads out Michael's rights with patients, Michael responds with frequent head nods and direct eye contacts, suggesting that he wants to actively engage and cooperate throughout the interrogation. He decided to cooperate because he was already aware that the police mm. knew he was directly involved in the crime. Well, man, I'm, you know, I just kind of got thrown into this, so I was hoping maybe you could kind of just go back at the beginning when all this started and kind of tell me what happened, because I need, I need kind of the details so we know and understand what, what you went through and stuff. Okay, so I'm the very start. Mm -hmm. Okay, about like, uh, Two months ago. Okay. That's when we first uh, really started talking. So when you say we, who are you talking about? Me and my brother who is also. Your brother? brother? Yeah, who is he has to do with me? And what's his name? Uh, Robert Pepper. Robert? Okay. And how old is he? Uh, 18. Okay. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, a couple months ago, I think we back to the start this year, we started talking about uh, Bojo and Lampage and stuff like that. Okay. And I didn't take it seriously at first, but then he started buying like a Oh, this English stuff. Where did he buy body armor from? eBay and Amazon. Oh, okay. Yeah, legal. Does yeah. he have a job? He did at my tech. He quit. So there you go. Like this. Um, Boy got list. And uh, basically, it just kept escalating. He kept getting burned, and he asked if I went to and I said yes. So he got me my own set. Oh, okay. And then about a month, about like June thirtieth. Is when he came to me and said he found out that he can legally buy guns without permit in Oklahoma that he could. Okay. And uh, that's when he started planning. Michael's response to the first question related to the crime, marked by a deep sigh, suggests a degree of emotional weight or hesitation. As Michael continues to describe the planning of the crime, there is a noticeable shift in his voice and posture. 
His voice becomes clearer, and there is a hint of passion which suggests that he is becoming more emotionally invested or engaged in sharing the details of the planning. Okay. There's something, and um, they be bought, I think it was like 250 shotgun rounds okay. on eBay. Not eBay, but on some website. On some website. And then I think he bought close to 1,000 rounds for the clocks. Wow, okay. And the but he's still to be a Oh, so he was supposed to have to take those up. Mm -hmm. While Michael informs detectives the details of the weapons and the ammunition that Robert bought, Detective Bentz gives a surprising expression with the word wow. This expression may genuinely reflect his astonishment at the amount and nature of the weapons and ammunitions discussed. It can also be a deliberate strategy to take out more information from Michael. By expressing surprise or amazement, the detective is probably attempting to create an atmosphere where Michael feels encouraged to share additional details. In this case, the response is quite spontaneous, and thus it's most likely that the detective is surprised more than strategic. So then, uh, so, so he was buying weapons because mm -hmm. you guys had talked about murdering. Yeah, and he started planning it. Yeah. Okay. And I went along with it because I didn't see the other way. I thought I wouldn't want to do it. I very quickly learned tonight that I didn't. Okay. That you didn't want to do it. I don't. Want you have fucking right. I didn't. Right here. Uh, just because I didn't kill anyone. Okay. I stabbed someone. Who did you stab? Um, my younger brother, Christopher. Christopher. How old is Christopher? Um, nine, I think. What did you stab him with? Oh, uh, my knife. What's your knife look like? It's green. Um, kind of like camouflage, honestly. Um, where your hand goes or where the blade is? Holy shit. It's camouflage? Yeah, it's all camouflage. Oh, the whole thing? Yeah. How big is it? Show me how big it is. I think it's about this big. Okay. What so what was what was Christopher doing when you stabbed him? He was laying on the bathroom floor. Robert was also stabbing and Robert asked him to go over and help him. So I stabbed Christopher and then Where did you stab him? Oh, stabbed at the neck. Really? Okay. You okay? Yeah. You okay. Let me know if you need a break or anything, okay? I'm good. Um so was Christopher still alive when you stabbed him? Yes. What was he saying and doing? He was just screaming. screaming. Was, did you say he was in the bathroom? Yeah, I was next to the toilet. Um, Michael in this section admits his direct involvement in the crime by confirming that he stabbed Christopher, one of the victims. This confession is a significant development in the interrogation. Although Michael's statement wow. that he didn't mean to kill Christopher suggests a complex emotional response such as remorse or regret for his actions, his actions need to be considered. Additionally, Michael looks visibly uncomfortable while explaining the details of how he stabbed Christopher. It suggests that saying these details out loud may be emotionally distressing for him, and he may be struggling to confront the reality of his actions. Mm. Why did he want to do that? Kill people? Yeah. Um, well, mainly two reasons, I think. It's um, because he just like he says he hates everyone he thinks society is pointless, and so he mm. wanted People. Yeah, and he also he wanted to like beat, um, beat the kill, like amount of other famous people like Colin Bond and uh, James Egan Holmes. Okay, did you kind of feel that way too? Like when you guys were talking earlier, like yeah, I, it like do you have a problem with society too? You think? No, no, I just. Or you were just more like the the number of people getting killed was kind of interesting and yeah, exciting. Yeah. Okay. Here, Michael initially confirms the inspiration for their violent plan to Robert's hatred for society and its insignificance. A notable contrast is evident when Michael is asked if he shares the same feelings about society as Robert. He confesses that his primary Do fascination was with the number of people they could kill and that he didn't have a strong concern for society. This reveals that the two brothers had their individual motivations and priorities. Michael's response offers insight into his mindset, revealing a disturbing fascination with a potential scale of violence. This may be indicative of a detached or disturbed perspective of reality, potentially tied to psychological factors. So, because um, you mentioned a couple names of, are those like serial killers or something? What, like Columbine? Yeah. Uh, Columbine and James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot up the theater. In Colorado? Yeah, he killed 12. And, uh, wow. How many were killed in Columbine? Columbine, I don't know, like 15, okay. I think. Um, so did you he guys just have got goal? that on the top did of his noggin, like. He just wanted, wow. I think he wanted to kill like 50. Okay. I mean, I 
So how, okay, so as the planning goes, tell me, tell me what, what plans you started making and coming up with. Well, originally, I think Con stayed steady uh, throughout the month, is so though we wanted to let everyone at the house first. Okay. And then wait for all the packages to show up over the weekend. Um, and then we take the economy to have our state with the guns and uh, still, okay. still okay. Rampaging. Did you know where you were going to drive to? Uh, towards Washington. Washington State or DC? Washington State. It's okay. Washington State. Why would you go to Washington State? Michael reveals that he and Robert drew inspiration for their violent actions from the violence perpetrated by infamous serial killers like James Holmes, who Yo, killed good, 15 Cap people Crusader. in the Colorado theater, and the Columbine High School shooting by Eric Harris. This admission highlights their influence from real-life individuals who committed heinous crimes. It indicates a desire for notoriety, or a distorted sense of being famous. There is a potential chance that their detailed planning and obsession was due to this external influence. From the interrogation that we've covered earlier, Aaron Yabara also drew his inspiration from Eric Harris. Aaron Yabara, 26 years old. How, I mean, how long have you had these feelings? Uh, the evil feelings or the good ones? Both. Uh, since I was 13, the, the good feelings, mm -hmm. until 23 when my stuff got taken away. My bedroom furniture got taken away. So in the last three years, you've started having these bad feelings? Yeah. And can you describe the bad feelings to me? I started, uh, I just felt nothing but hate, 100% hate towards the world, towards everyone. I threatened to master the local bar once because uh, I just wanted everything and everyone to die. And then Columbine came to mind. I don't know how, but it just hit me. I've been, when I was watching the news when I was a kid, Oh, Columbine, look, Eric Harris just came into my head, the mastermind of the shooting. Right. And I kept identifying with him ever since the, the past three years because he just made everything so exciting. He made hate so exciting. An outright example of how this news has a negative influence on teenagers. So then kind of what happened is, I mean, you guys started getting all that stuff together and yeah. throwing things away. And yeah, and we do with the, all the packages and holsters, alibis, all that stuff was going to get healthy on Amazon. And so we set a date. So was the plan um, to use the knives at first on yeah. the family? Because the guns weren't going to be here till later on? Yeah, and the guns would be too loud. Oh, I see. So um, going to use the knives on the family, which obviously mm -hmm. did not go as planned. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I just sold the red swords right now. Like, we didn't put more people out there. What? Yeah. Did, um, so then you picked a date, you said? Yeah, which was yesterday. Yesterday night was the date. So you picked a time and everything? Yep, yeah, midnight. When most of you were in bed, except for mom. So how did you guys know? He just came and got you, or you got him, or what did you guys we, we were hanging out, y'all, that's good waiting. Okay, and so... How did you pick the date? Um, we were eager holding on with the packages and stuff we have. Because, you know, all the ammunition, he didn't want them to see that. So we killed him the day before the ammunition got held, the day after the move. Do you guys, um, do you guys not like your mom and dad? I mean, is there, have they, I mean, I'm, most teenagers don't like their parents, so I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, mom's okay, but dad was a little bit, you know. Just a little bit too much. Yes. In this section, Michael reveals that they chose the attack date based on the ammunition delivery, with Robert's motive being to hide it from their family. This suggests the distorted perspective that the brothers have about reality, and they just needed an excuse to inflict violence. Moreover, he also explains that they opted for knives over guns to minimize noise and attention. Here, notably, Michael expresses a relief that they didn't get the ammunition after all, recognizing the potential for even more widespread harm, possibly showing a hint of remorse or Nigga, you just killed your whole family! Violence. My sister, and um, she came in because she was going to go to bed. She came in to tell us. Um, How old was she? Thirteen. Okay. She came in to tell us that mom wanted to get the kitchen done before we went to bed and put the cats up. And basically, we did what we planned. I did. I, uh, I got to my desk, and I like had to look at something to this cat to roll up or went up behind her. Grabbed to him and slept with you. 
Really? What yeah. did they use? Oh, this large red knife. Okay, the large red knife. Yeah, it's like my. Thing is it? It's like my. Oh, like I see. I think. Um, and then she fell to the ground screaming. Mom and Dad, you know, Mom came in first, and then. She is your room home. upstairs or I, I don't know. I haven't been um, house, so I don't know. Our room is downstairs. It's towards the back. The okay. House. And so she fell down and started screaming. Yeah, when I got up standing, well, I kind of freaked out because, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't planning on this. Were you saying anything or, I mean? I just stood there. Okay. Oh, this nigga is evil. Mom came in yelling, called the police. And then he went over and stabbed her. Then he stabbed her? Yeah, he probably stabbed her, pushed her, you know, floated down the hallway. And people got up and ran. Okay. She ran out the door. When now, okay, so she sat down at your desk wow. and he slid her through. You said. Well, she was standing at my desk and oh, came up behind and slid her through, and then she fell down screaming. And then he stabbed her some more? When he was stabbing her some more, was it, where was he stabbing her? Her neck. Oh, her neck. Her neck and her stomach. Stomach, okay. And, um, and then my mom came in and she started yelling, called the police, get dad. And then he came up and started attacking her. And then she actually got up and ran out the front door. Wow. And um, once mom was on the ground, he got up and started chasing after her. And what were you doing? Standing Did you come out in the hallway? No, I was just standing in the room. And the process, I don't know what I was doing. Michael shows visible signs of discomfort during his explanation of the first attack initiated by himself and Robert on his 13-year-old sister. Restlessness, along with deep and heavy breaths, suggests that recounting the details of this violent act is emotionally distressing for him. Detective Bentz, on the other hand, adopts a composed and steady demeanor throughout this time. His questioning and cross-questioning are aimed at gaining insights related to the psychological factors that drove the two brothers to commit such a heinous act. So he stabbed your mom with the same knife? Yep, same. And where did he stab her? I think in the neck, too. Okay. And then, um, and, no, actually, he stabbed her in the neck, pushed her into the kitchen, and then together. So with you, she started screaming and ran into the family. You know, at the same time, he fell asleep. Then left the house. Okay. I ran over and disabled the alarm. Okay. That's what I did. And then Where's ran, the, the pad for your alarm? It's now the front door. It's what? It's now the front door. Near the front door? Yeah. Yo, he talked like a fucking room. baby. That's what it is. He pronounced some of his words yeah. baby as his fuck. She already gone outside. She went outside and then went after her. Oh, boy. So where where did she. Uh, she she was laying in the driveway and he to go her back from. You know, the bench, you know, if you know, the road, and start choking her. Like on the bench? Out yeah. front? Yeah, it was like a little Huge bitch. elephant. And went back inside to go after the little kids. Did he bring her in, or did she stay out there? She stayed out there until he asked me if he didn't come in. I ran out. I had to go her inside. That's why she was in the, um, in the interview. I had to go her inside. She oh, you still, brought her back in? Yeah, was she was still alive? Yeah, she was still screaming. And then, that's about the time, Dad came down. Okay. Because his bedroom's upstairs. And he went back in the police area where Robert was. The police area, that's what they call it. Um, our room. Um, and they started attacking there. They got a little bit of a fight. Um, but then eventually, Robert got him down. And um, I think he killed him. Did he cut his throat too? Michael's quick response to questions without much hesitation may suggest his eagerness to get done with this conversation as soon as possible because he was slowly getting more and more uncomfortable. Detective Bentz recognizes Michael's discomfort and employs a calm and reassuring tone in response. By adjusting his tone and demeanor, he attempts to convey understanding and empathy, emphasizing the importance of discussing the details. This approach aims to create a supportive and non-confrontational atmosphere, encouraging Michael to share more openly. Daniel was in uh, his room, which is you know, down the hall, and I was oh, like, "Let me." How old is Daniel? Oh, um, I think it's I think it's twelve. Okay. And um, I was like, "Let me in, oh, mm. let me in." They were saying that on the phone with the police. I grabbed the phone, phone which is my phone, got my phone, and then I ran into the kitchen and I smashed the underground. So which was your phone? Yeah, it was my phone. Oh. Now you don't have a cell phone anymore. No, I don't. <laughs> um. And Daniel went back there, and he, um, and Daniel and Christopher, Christopher locked himself in the bathroom, Daniel locked himself in Dad's office. Okay. And then I finally got both of them to open the door, um, because they thought I wanted in there to see. But they were in different room. rooms? Yeah, they were right next to each other. Right? Oh, I see. And then, um, Robert went in and stabbed him, and they went 
in and uh, stabbed Christopher. That's when, that's when I stabbed Christopher. So when he stabbed Daniel, where did he stab Daniel? I think he um, shanked him in the neck and then Daniel ran off. And so oh, Daniel. fucking goodness. He started attacking Christopher. So Daniel got stabbed in the neck and ran off? Yeah. Where did he run to? He ran into the family room about mom. Mom ended up, she was lying on the ground yelling, call 911. Okay. And, and he stopped in there? Yeah, he lay, he collapsed in there, and then Michael came in and started stabbing him in the chest. Oh, I see. Um, then... And then, who's the youngest, the four-year-old? The four-year-old, I don't know what happened with her. I hope she's alive. I'm I, sorry, I, I, I missed that. The, the one that you stabbed, who, who was that? Christopher. Christopher, that's what he's I'm saying. He's a four-year-old, I think. He's eight. Ten. And he was in the bathroom. Yep. Yeah. So Daniel had got stabbed in the neck, ran out. To where your mom was. Yeah. He, Robert yeah. followed him, stabbed him some more. Yeah, after after we uh, stabbed Christopher in the bedroom. Oh, I see. Okay. And um, and then basically after that, Vinny uh, was pretty much dead. We forgot oh, about Robert. Who was dead? Everyone, I think. Okay. Looked like they were dead except for she was lying in the interview screaming. Then that was a knock at the door. Okay. Someone knocked at the door. I think that might be the neighbor because the police wouldn't be there yet. And they just kept knocking on the door. So we turned around, I grabbed on, uh, put my soft vest and heavy vest on. I was carrying the plates, I put my helmet on. And then we went, we went up the back door of Darren's office, climbed over the fence, went down into the park, and started cutting through the woods. Okay. Oh, well, we both collapsed. I think so, I was we were just sitting there. Michael's inability to maintain direct eye contact suggests discomfort or unease while discussing this part in the interrogation. This avoidance of eye contact can be indicative of internal emotional conflict, guilt, or reluctance to confront the severity of his actions. Michael's description of how he lured his younger brother and subsequently stabbed them with little apparent remorse is chilling. The remorseless nature of the crime committed by Michael reveals a disturbing detachment from his closest people. Michael providing a detailed account of the final phase of the crime, including the escape to nearby woods to hide, indicates a willingness to cooperate with the interrogation process. Um, Can you kind of, okay, I'm a little bit lost, I think because there's too many people in this house. Um, there's you, there's Robert, okay, you're 16, he's 18, then who's next? Yeah, she's the third oldest, she was the first one. Okay, and then Daniel? And then Christopher. Then Christopher. And then Victoria. Victoria. She's four. Yeah, Victoria's four. Okay, and what's mom's name? April. April? April that um, unmarried baby name, I think you call it, is Sharp. Sharp? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and Victoria's four. Mm-hmm. And then what's dad's name? Uh, David. David? Okay. David. And then... Are there any other kids? How many kids is that? Um, That's... Then there was... I mean, she's a baby, she's about to turn to toddler. She was up in her bed. Okay. I think I was, he forgot about her. And I think she stayed asleep until the police came. So okay. I saw them give her out, so she's okay. I knew three niggas that taught like this nigga in middle school. True story. So you saw them carrying her out? Yeah. yeah baby ass like, words. Was it the plan was to kill her too, though? He just want to kill her one. Okay. Detective Rihanna Russell takes the initiative to reiterate the number of family members involved with an attempt to have a proper clarification mm. and also have additional information based on Michael's willing participation in the interrogation. What However, happened to him? Michael I don't know. A disturbing revelation. Okay, good though. He told detectives that they had initially planned to kill even the youngest sibling, Autumn, but that Robert forgot about her. This detail explains the level of premeditation involved in their actions while also revealing a lapse in their plan. Michael also mentions seeing the youngest siblings safe in police custody when they were arrested. This suggests a degree of concern or relief regarding her well-being, adding complexity to his emotional state and motivations. So we talked a lot about your plans in the beginning, because here's what I don't understand is, um, as, you, as you and Robert kind of planning things out, I mean, because you seem like a really smart kid and that you kind of, I mean, it seems like you had some pretty detailed plans. You guys had good equipment and weapons. And it seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I would think that as you guys plan this out, you had maybe more specific plans like, 
Robert was going to kill this person, and yeah. you were going to yeah. kill. So who were you supposed to kill? I was supposed to take my pistol crossbow. Who was supposed to shank his soul? She was supposed to die quietly. Yeah, she was going to be the first one she was. And then um, Robert would go in, slit my arms through, push her over with him, and both go in and crawl. Because it was supposed to be like quiet, right? Yeah, it was supposed to be like that. And then I would go upstairs and uh, shoot David, Dad, and the guy with my pistol crossbow would okay. kill him. And then Robert would go over and kill him. Okay. Bro. In this part of the interrogation, what? Detective Benz seeks to extract detailed information about the attack. A subtle yet significant observation occurs when Michael, in the course of describing Robert's actions in their father's room, uses the name David instead of the more familiar Dad. Although, it's not an uncommon practice in Western culture to call parents by their name, but it is not appreciated either. Who calling their parents this by their name? What the fuck? This terminology suggests a notable emotional Western distance culture. between Michael and his father. The use of the father's first name rather than the affectionate or familiar term might imply a certain emotional distance or detachment from his father. This potentially shed light on their family <laughs> dynamics, as David was quite strict with his children, and the kids were mostly homeschooled <laughs> and did not do much social interaction as well. Dying so, if you call your parent by their first name. Who, who all died? Who do you know died for sure? Like, what's the count? How do we know? I don't know. Okay. Who do you think died? Um, dad, mom, Dan, well, that's, that's not all I know because I saw them. And Daniel's the one that used dad? Um, no, Chris was one I stabbed. Daniel's right. the one you went in and uh, right, that's right. stabbed him in the box. And he was in the living room with mom. And Christopher, you stabbed him in the neck. Yeah, he was in the bath, you know. So how did, I mean, was he still making noise when you left, or how did that go? Yeah, down? he was still yelling at me, I left him. Um, I think he might have been alive, because later I came back and the door was shot and locked it, he had to kick it down. Okay. Um, just got my little schools and that door now. So, um, You kicked it down? I didn't kick it down. Okay. I just got it. I tried to. Nobody kicked it down. Oh. It stayed intact all the way. I'm going to know if he's still alive. Did you, because um, here's what I'm seeing happen. You know, you guys had all these detailed plans. You had all the cool stuff to make it happen. Yeah. And it kind of started falling apart. And he said, like, cool it just goes planned. I think, I mean, did you kind of just freak out a little bit? Like, yeah, it was yeah. really happening? Well, I, I, you know, I didn't know it was going to like, yeah, you don't. But here's what's here's what's getting me is like, it's crazy because you guys worked together and made all these plans, and you know had it all figured out. And then when it happens, you're just kind of standing there not doing anything. And did you did you decide like Robert's going to kill everybody, and I'm going to stand here and do nothing? So I better. I mean, did you? Is yeah, that, I think I think that was my plan. I was. I, I didn't want to kill anyone, I love anyone, I couldn't do it, so I was going to let him, like, kill everyone. Yeah, you stabbed somebody in the neck. No, I mean, I just kind of... Detective Bentz is actively trying to gauge Michael's mental state, especially to understand his feeling, considering a few hours have already passed after the crime was committed. With Detective Bentz's consistent push, Michael admits Robert killed most of the members, minimizing his involvement. Detective Benson employs a reverse psychology tactic by suggesting that both brothers wanted to be famous, encouraging mm. Michael not to give away all the credit to Robert. This approach is aimed at motivating Michael to share more details on that November by today. his role and significance in the event. It plays shit. on Dance, the desire for recognition and notoriety, potentially encouraging Michael to Stream. open up more. Um, so here's Yo, a problem that we might have. When is the summer's ban for ban? I don't want it to be an issue for you because you've been really cooperative. Yo, uh, um, every Sunday... Hold on, yeah, I gotta I gotta pause this Robert's video to make this announcement. Yo, every Sunday, I want everybody in here to just wear a white pair of draws, and then like after the whole day is over, you know, just post your draws hashtag uh, Sunday Fun Day, real shit. Especially the niggas in here who've been talking shit. Everybody wear a pair of white draws, and if they come out clean, I'm a bitch. You can talk shit to me like I'm a hoe. Whatever y'all think I am, I'm that. Until further notice. So he's going to give us his version of the story, and, you know, sometimes they're going to be different. So, um, is there anything... Real man can wear white draws. You kind of didn't quite... No, right, Or you changed a little bit, 
and now that you understand that Robert's going to tell me everything. I, 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 Real men wear um, white drawers. What can I tell you that I can forgive them? Because that's why I told him, you know, when we were sitting out in the woods, you know, to make conversation. But, you know, forensics will show you how they stab Christopher. What three? What do you mean you told him? So you told him that you killed three people? Yeah, I told him, because he asked me how many did you get. I said three. Did you tell him who you got? No, I just said three. Oh my god. Um. So do you, I, I guess this is my question for you. Do you think it's a lesser sentence if you killed one or if you killed three? No. What, I mean, I don't know, I, I think Robert, he may have, there's going to be a lot of differences, that's what I'm concerned about. And we don't want you to come off as a liar, I mean, because you've been real cooperative, you seem like a really good kid, you know, you graduated high school early, um, what? you're designing games, I mean... Brett just threw all that shit out, out. fuck it, like... And so what? I don't want people to get a bad opinion of you. I wish I graduated. And I'm think that you're here. the type of guy that lies to police when he's kind of caught. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so tell me, I know that you're leaving something out. There's, I mean, because it, it's like she said, um, you know, you're, mm. this isn't like, Wagwan. Wagwan not running you, Wagwan. You know, so it's a big deal. Um, but a lot of people, when they talk and think about this thing, your honesty is a big deal and how you handle yourself from here on out. And if you come off, because to me, you don't seem like a bad guy. You know, like, you don't scare me. I, I mean, I never, never thought you would have done this. So you just seem like a normal kid to me. And you seem like an honest kid. But see, I talk to people all the time. And I mean, I, I know when people are lying or when when... I'm not quite getting the whole story. And so I just want to catch you before you get in that bad spot where people start saying you're a bad guy, you're evil, you're a liar. So just tell me what I'm missing. Oh, I mean, along with the dude thing, I was uh, going around to like convincing the people who were still alive that like I was on the side, I called the police, you know, so they would like stay and I would get them. So they kind of stay on the ground and he he'd be able to come stab him again. Yeah. Did you ever have to um, <clears throat> go get Robert to let him know someone was still making too much noise or anything? No, no, it was, it was uh, chaotic. It was just going from person to person. So what yeah, kind so of things did you say to them? Uh, but uh, the only things I uh, said to them was when I was trying to convince them that I was with them so they would, you know, come to me and he could kill them. Okay. And that's all you think that he might tell me different? Um, Is he going to lie to me? I don't know. I don't think he would lie because I'm pretty sure the only reason he's like he want he let himself get arrested and so like getting him major shootout and dying from the police is because he wants to see the aftermath. So I don't know what he's going to do. Oh, I see. In wow. this interrogation section, wow. Detective Benz wow. informs wow. Michael that Robert will also be questioned, stressing the chance for Michael to correct any inaccuracies. Despite this, Michael remains composed, answering with confidence through direct eye contact and frequent head nods. He acknowledges the possibility of Robert lying about Michael's involvement due to an obsession with assuming full responsibility, offering insight into their motivations. Detective Benz's transparent approach, mentioning Robert's interrogation and the consequences of falsehoods, seems effective in encouraging Michael's cooperation and truthfulness. So you think he may kind of just tell us what happened to him? Okay. Did you guys talk about um, being on the news and getting to see each other on TV and stuff? Yeah. What kind of things did you say and talk about? Um, mostly about how we were playing by killing more people. You know, yeah. From the top. And um, I would become famous, we'd get on Wikipedia lists. Oh, okay. People. That'd so, be a big deal, yeah. I mean, do you think they might even make a movie <laughs> or something, or a TV show? I'm, about I'm sorry, bro, that shit was about Did you guys talk about that? Yeah, definitely. It's a, that'd be a big deal, yeah. You just wow. want to be famous. What did you want? Famous. Mm -hmm. You keep talking about what he wanted, what did you want? No, I just want to go by the news program. 
But you, I mean, your your big brother's telling you he wants to be famous, and you guys are making these plans. Surely you want some I, of that I fame do, too, right? Yeah, I do want to do it with him because, like, he's going to do it no matter what. He says if I don't do it with him, they'll just kill me too, or leave me there. So um, yeah, Tank, I'm straight. You know, Michael shares right significant now, though, information like, about his sad. intention to kill his family. He discloses that Robert insisted on his assistance with the attack, emphasizing Robert's active role in planning Didn't and executing the violence. Friends. Michael goes on to explain that Robert intended to kill all family members anyway and threatened to kill Michael if he didn't comply and join in. This revelation highlights the intimidating and manipulative tactics employed by Robert to ensure Michael's participation in the violent acts. Given the strong bonds between the two brothers, Michael's choice to participate in the violence can be seen as a survival instinct. However, there is no denying that Michael had opportunities to stop Robert as he mentioned in the beginning that they were planning for this for two months. Damn. Moreover, during the interrogation, there is no significant proof that he regretted his action. He didn't shed a single drop of tears while describing how each member was killed. Thus, his intention to blame Robert for all the murders might not work out. Although Michael's disclosure of Robert forcing him to join in could potentially provide him with some benefit of doubt in the legal proceedings. Um, kind of gave me a quick version of what he's saying that you did. Yeah. And, and you haven't told me everything, okay? So I know you're not being completely honest and... Uh, I gave you one shot already. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what you might have said. I mean, I don't know. Well, you stabbed more than one person. So who else did you stab? Or you stabbed more than just one time? Oh, I stabbed Christopher more than one time. How many times did you stab him? I think twice. Because you don't think we're going to know that? Stop I, thinking I know. and go with what you know. You mentioned forensics a minute ago. I know. I mean, I'm... I'm just one of like hundreds of people that are gonna look at this thing, okay? I mean, we got we got the state police coming in. Uh, there's I don't know twenty different forensic detectives at your house right now. Um, They're gonna be there a long time because of the scene that it is. So everybody that you killed and every single stab wound that you inflicted, we're gonna know about. And this is your last chance to just kind of let us know, to be honest, to man up and tell us exactly what you did and, and start making it right. Mm. I had Christopher. I did not stab Victoria with Daniel. You did not stab Victoria? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, um, I think I had to stab them all. You stabbed them all? I think, yeah, I got when she was walking away, I think I had to do for a night, but, you know. Is that when you cut yourself? Yeah, yeah I think that after that. Where did you stab her? I just had to go from behind and cut her whole body. Did you cut her? Yeah, I think so, yeah. You, this doesn't seem like something you have to think about. I know it's, it's you're still kind of dealing with it. Um, and I wasn't there, I wasn't the one doing it. But you don't have to think about it. You know what you did. So you, you cut her neck, you stabbed Christopher in the neck. How many times did you stab Christopher? Two or three, I think. And who else did you stab? Besides mom. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, everybody's been stabbed, and you both had knives, and we know you both stabbed everybody. So you guys are kind of at the same level, and so now it's, who's gonna be honest and make this right, and who's a liar? Okay. That boy's Which a liar. Do you want to be? I'm not a liar. Okay, so you're a man of your word? Yes. Okay. And do you want to make this right and do the right thing at this point in time? Yes. Okay. What else okay. are you missing? You want to start over then? Come on. You, you tell us where you need to start. He stabs I didn't stab I just stabbed to a though. Detective Benz's direct confrontation with Michael about his role in the crime creates a pressure on Michael and a sense of urgency to address inconsistencies in his previous statements. Michael's nervousness becomes apparent in his facial expressions as he faces this confrontation. With forensic evidence and Robert's confession, Michael's defense finally starts to crumble. This shift in his narrative is a response to the change that Detective Benz made in terms of the intensity of his assertiveness in addressing Michael. Damn. We only stabbed, you only stabbed the family. Are you your supposed family. to be Winnie the Pooh? Because they yeah. away. <laughs> Yo, I did. <laughs> I did ask God on red or yellow. What the fuck? The reason we used to kind of kill family is um, they were in the way into him. You know, and I'm off hella royal honey right now. That's terrible. Just to start. I, for 
however long I've been oh, on so this bitch. Is this all a game? I mean, this higher count, I'm confused. Is this a game? It's a more like to kind of become famous, kind of get, you know, set a record. Did you, now, because you said, you said this yourself, mm. you told Robert you killed three, yep. and so now we're stuck at the point where you proof. told us you stabbed proof. Christopher proof. And your proof. mother. Is there one more person that you stabbed and, and you didn't mention earlier? I, I can speak to my mom that I, I didn't stab anybody else, but this is one more I thought I it was going to interview the other nigga. What you've done. No. I, I didn't like it the minute it started. I, I mean, how do you feel about your mother? Yeah, your mom gone, nigga. Mm -hmm. I mean, you I mean, she, you watched her get stabbed. You, you cut her throat yourself, and you watched her bleed all over the place and scream. How does that make you feel? Not. Not think about it. You don't want to think about it. And Christopher, your little brother, I mean, you stabbed him in the neck. What, is, what has he ever done to you? So he's just a number. Yes. And how does, I mean, how do you feel about that now? It's pointless. It's what? Pointless. Pointless. Wow. Wow. Just a number. Do you, um, do you, would you be willing to write us a statement kind of explaining what we just talked about? Yeah. Um, kind of starting at the beginning. Papers. Like, papers. I don't know if I can get that um, Yeah, and in papers, what I'm talking about. In this concluding part of the interrogation, Michael finally admits to a sinister motive. The family's murder was just the start of a plan for mass killings, driven by a desire for fame through violence. When asked about his feelings regarding the violence against his mother and his little brother, Michael acknowledges his discomfort and emotional detachment, possibly stemming from deep-rooted psychological issues and disturbed family dynamics. He also reveals that at the time of the crime, he dehumanized them as just Nigga numbers head way in too order big to get for his famous. Fucking body. But now he recognizes the pointlessness of it all, hitting at a sense of regret. Although three years after the crime took place, Michael oh, well, received his court verdict on May 10th, 2018. The jury, after more than five Stop hours of deliberation, it, found Michael Beaver guilty of killing his parents and three younger siblings, as well as attempting to kill his then 13-year-old sister, who survived and became a key witness for the prosecution. <gasps> The verdict was delivered based on the testimonies provided by Crystal Beaver and a wealth of evidence, including the interrogation footage. When Judge Sharon Holmes read the verdict, it had a profound impact on those present in the courtroom. Many of the jurors openly wept as the verdict was announced. Michael, upon hearing the verdict, fell to the floor and had to be assisted back into his seat by a sheriff's deputy. This dramatic moment marked a significant turning point in the legal proceedings surrounding the tragic case. Robert Beaver ultimately pleaded guilty to all charges and received a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Michael Beaver's trial commenced on April 16, 2018, and he was sentenced on August 9, 2018 to life in prison with the potential for parole. This case left a deep trauma in the hearts of the people of Oklahoma, particularly yeah. within the Broken Arrow community. The gruesome nature of the crime made neighbors uneasy and disturbed by the sight of the property. It served as a daily reminder of the tragedy, turning a once vibrant family home where children played into a place haunted by dark memories for all who bore witness to it. Consequently, the city council made the decision to transform the property into a reflection park. As the city councilor Mike Lester expressed it, this place is a place that nobody wishes to remember, but one that nobody can ever forget. Oh. The park was an attempt to bend the perspective and create a positive narrative as a closure for this case. As Park we is haunted. this harrowing case, we are left with a profound sense of the impact that violence and tragedy can have on a community. The transformation of a once happy family home into a haunting reminder of the past serves as a stark reminder of the fragility of our lives and the enduring power of memories. As we reflect on this case, it prompts us to ask some challenging questions. Did the Beaver brothers consider the consequences of their plans? Did Michael kill his little brother Christopher and his mother just to save himself from Robert? Or did he have personal motivation in terms of gaining fame? How does a community heal from such deep wounds? If you have any such case that you want us to cover, add them below in the comment section. Like, share, and subscribe Holy. to our channel for more such comments. Holy f